بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الكريم وبعد um, I say all the time that it's a great honor and a great privilege um, to be in this space and to be united with women and men in pursuit of beneficial knowledge. And uh, as uh, Sidi Umair was mentioning, this book comes out of a lifelong uh, endeavor for Imam Ghazali. And even the person of Imam Ghazali, you know, Ghazali is one of those names that you are almost certain to encounter you know, upon embracing Islam or entering religious uh, spaces, there are some names you will hear over and over again. Like Bukhari, you will hear that name over and over again. Aisha, radiallahu anha, you will hear that name over and over again. Ghazali, although not a companion of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, not even a follower of the companions, jazakallah khair, not even um, a follower of the companions, you still hear his name mentioned often. It's very easy to detect the prominence of Imam Ghazali. And there's a reason for that. Um, Imam Ghazali is seen as a theologian that lived the substance of his theology. This is what makes him special, is that that journey to certainty is something you see epitomized in his own life. And in his spiritual autobiography called al munkid the Min al-Dalal, that which the, I guess you could translate it, deliverance from error, he talks about his own spiritual breakdown. He talks about how he fell into absolute doubt about Islam in spite of learning a great deal and being celebrated and esteemed as a scholar, he said, while people were celebrating me, while people were mentioning my name with the greatest encomium and praise, and I didn't even know if I was certain about this religion. And then he undertakes a journey to find certainty and to find what we call ikhlas or like sincerity. And the first lesson that we can derive from that is that great outward knowledge and great inward knowledge are not equivalent. A person might be capable of rattling off names of books, theological principles, legal principles, names of scholars, names of companions of the Prophet ﷺ, and all of that might not go past their throat in terms of what is actually in their heart, what is actually at the root of their belief. And then you can have a person, very simple, very... Um, um, and I mean simple, not unsophisticated, but an elegant simplicity, right? And they could reach the peaks. They could reach the, the summit of faith. So a lot of the people that Ghazali sat with, read with, studied with, were people that didn't know what he knew in terms of the outward knowledge of Islam, but these were people that had uh, true faith. These were people that were certain about their Iman. You know, I once asked a brother, I said, who's the most pious person you've ever had the pleasure of sharing company with? He said, without hesitation, my grandmother. I said, mashallah. I said, I love to ask questions like that. And then I want to know, what do you think they did that helped them gain that kind of piety, that kind of religious sense so that I can emulate, if possible? He said she would do a khatam of the Quran almost every night. I was like, whoa. <laughs> I'm like, okay, so there's no possibility of emulating her. I said, she must have like, you know, because in my experience with the Quran, Reciting Quran is something that requires great stamina, 
It's not just like you learn to do it. And it's something that some people can recite for hours and it doesn't even uh, fatigue them. Some people we recite for like 10 minutes. It's like, ooh, ooh. Um, I recited some Quran today. So I said, man, when did she start reading Quran? If she can do a khatam every night. He said, oh, no, no, she's illiterate. I said, so she just recites from memory? He said, no, 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 no. She opens the mushaf and she takes her right index finger and she runs her fingers over, she runs her finger over the lines and she says, this is true, this is true, this is true, this is true, until she completes the entire Quran. And I was thinking, subhanAllah. And the person that was informing me of this, he himself was a scholar of Islam. But the person he identified as having the most exemplary piety was not someone who sat for years like he did, memorizing books and sitting at the feet of scholars, but just someone that had a pure heart. And that reminded me of a story about another great scholar of Islam. His name was Imam Fakhr Din al-Razi. It was great. And he was a theologian. And he had a majlis. He had a gathering in which people would attend and they would ask all kinds of very complicated, complex theological questions. And Fakhr al-Din al-Razi would sit there in the middle of the gathering, answering those questions with the greatest ease. Oh, oh, oh. And if you got an opportunity to sit in that gathering, just being there was like, oh my God. I'm watching one of the finest minds of my time, helping people to clarify their faith. What a delight, what a treat. And so one young man, he sat and he listened to Imam Fakhruddin al-Razi respond to 40 separate theological questions, all of them very complex. And he went home and he told his mother, I was in the majlis of Fakhruddin al-Razi and he responded, to 40 theological questions, all of them very complicated. It was amazing, the setting, the people. I couldn't believe I was there. His mother said, I'm not that impressed with that gathering. He said, you're not, why not? He said, those 40 questions. She said, those 40 questions are indicative of 40 doubts that those people had. I might not have questions that complex and sophisticated, but I don't have the doubts that animate those questions. I would be more impressed with the gathering of people like me, right? So here Imam Ghazali is speaking to a student at, a, at an advanced level of study saying, now that you've learned all that you've learned, I'm going to take you back to the basics. I'm going to summarize for you. I'm going to give you an abridged version of everything you should have learned during your years in the path of knowledge. And that's why this small, very easy to read book, in my estimation, is very valuable. Because after all of the learning, all of the memorizing, all of the reading, this is like, okay, this is like cliff notes. Do people still have those? No, you, we just go on Wikipedia now, right? But this is like, you know, uh, when a person, like the Four Dummies series, like, what do I need to know to have a technical competency in this field? This is what Imam Ghazali is offering you. Just without all of the embellishments, without all of the details, just give me the bare bone basics. And this is what he sets out to do in this book. We'll begin today. Bismillah. قال أبو بكر الصديق رضي الله عنه هذه الأجساد قفص الطيور أو إصطبل الضواب فتفكر في نفسك He begins Abu Bakr al-Siddiq May God be pleased with him And Sayyidina Abu Bakr is a good example of what we're talking about You know the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم He said if the Iman of Abu Bakr, the faith of Abu Bakr was placed on one side of a scale and the faith of the entire Ummah was placed on the other side of that scale, the faith of Abu Bakr would outweigh that of the entire Ummah. And then he said, 
and he's not the most knowledgeable of you. And he's not the most well-versed in the Quran of you. But this thing that elevates him, it's something in his heart. This is what elevates him. It's not that he's the most knowledgeable of you. It's not that he's the most well-versed in the Quran. It's something in his heart. Imam Ghazali said in another place that in your learning, in your devotion, in your practice, if you're seeking anything other than what Abu Bakr had in his heart, you're misguided. You're not pursuing the right thing. Your pursuit is misaimed, right? Your endeavor is misfired, right? So the title given to Sayyidina Abu Bakr is a Siddiq, which is the one who lives as a testimony to the truth, right? His life is a testimony to the truth. He said, these bodies are a cage for birds or a stable for beast. Think about, think about yourself. Which of them are you? He said, your body is either a cage for a bird that wants to take flight, meaning your soul. And we have to get back to um, speaking about the soul candidly and regularly. You know, I was watching um, uh, a talk that a Christian preacher was giving. And he asked the audience, how many of you believe we have souls? And everybody raised their hands. And he said, no, we are souls. We have bodies, right? That thinking about your soul as possessing a kind of primacy within your existence, that just the same way you think about taking care of your body, you think about eating, you think about exercising, you think about grooming, right? You think about right, all of this to ingratiate, to maintain, to um, uh, um, take care of your body. But many of us give no thought to what we're doing to nourish the soul that the soul also needs nourishment. It needs attention. It needs maintenance. It needs upkeep. It needs beautification, right? Look at what people spend on cosmetics. It's amazing. I mean, some people, mashallah, you go into the bathroom, you can barely use the sink. There's a gel or a cream or everywhere. It's like, man. MashaAllah, right? And, there, and there's an aspect of that that is commendable. The Prophet Sallallahu spoke about what? Husnul inaya bil madhar. Taking good care of your body. That is from our tradition. We don't believe in mortifying the flesh, devaluing the flesh. My body's nothing. I should smell. I shouldn't bathe regularly. I shouldn't take, I shouldn't, I should ignore fitness. No, that isn't our tradition. But our tradition is one in which you use the outward to direct you to the more important inward, right? This simple dua of the Prophet I think it's profound. The Prophet would look at himself in the mirror and he would say, Allahumma ahsin khuluqi kama ahsanta khalqi. He would say, oh God, beautify my character just as you have beautified my form. MashaAllah. Like, he didn't deny the beauty of his form. He wasn't like, I'm hideous, I'm ugly. That's not good for your self-esteem. He said, no, my, my, mashallah, I appreciate the way that I've been formed, but make my character beautiful in the same way that you have made my outward form beautiful, right? We have a culture... People post pictures, we talk about swag, we talk about panache, we talk about none of this has anything to do with the soul. And what's tripped out about it is that beautification of the soul is something that we can enhance as we get older. The physical, it diminishes as you get older. Trust me, I know, you know. Makes no difference if I work out every day of the week, 
I will not look like I did in my in my late twenties. It just doesn't happen. <laughs> it just doesn't. I'm just like man. When I was in my twenties, I could work out two days a week and just I could see everything. Now you know I'm one of those old guys in the gym. Does one set, looks in the mirror to see if something changed. No, there's no change, right? Because muscle density, we're losing it with age, right? Lung capacity, we're losing it with age, right? So I can't run the same way that I used to, right? I don't look just like I, this all, the physical is diminishing, but you can become more patient as you get older. You can become more forgiving as you get older. You can become more understanding as you get older. You can heighten your devotion as you get older. You can become more generous as you get older. You can become a better father as you get older, a better son as you get older, a better mother as you get older, a better daughter as you get older, a better friend as you get older. But you're not going to become physically better. Unless, of course, when you were younger, you know, you were physically not where you wanted to be. But generally speaking, the physical is diminishing and the spiritual, we should be trying to what? Enhance, improve, heighten, develop, build, right? He says, which of them are you? Is your soul a bird for which the body is a cage or is your soul a beast? for which the body is a stable, right? SubhanAllah, when you think about a beast being held in by a stable, what he's referring to in that analogy is that some people, the body is just a source of limitation for the, meaning like if they could, they would be even more devoted to their dunya. They would seek money to the point of not sleeping if they could. They would follow every vain pleasure if they could. The only thing limiting them is the body. It's like, well, you have to sleep a little bit. You can't, you can't ply your system with every drug or you would die. And for some people, the body is a cage, meaning what they desire is a nearness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the only thing preventing them from experiencing that nearness is this cage of the body. Right? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said in an authentic hadith, dunya sijnul mu'mini wa jinnatul kafir. That this world is a prison for the believer. And it's a paradise for the disbeliever. SubhanAllah. He continues. من أيهما أنت إن كنت من الطيور العلوية فحين تسمع فطنينا طب ارجعي إلى ربك He said if you are one of the heavenly birds when you hear the sound of the drumbeat of return to your Lord you will fly upwards till you roost on the highest towers in the garden. You know, subhanAllah, there's a hadith of the Prophet والسلام, and every time I read it, it frightens me. Man yuhibbu liqa Allah, fallahu yuhibbu liqa'ah. Whoever loves to meet God, meaning in death, then God loves to meet them. And this is not encouraging us to have like some morbid fascination with death. But it is saying that for people of deep faith, death is a kind of reunification. It's a kind of home going. It's a kind of, um, um, it's, a, it's a beginning. And it's not, yes, all of us should have a healthy, anxiety about death but that anxiety is born out of what knowledge of our own shortcomings knowledge of our inadequacies not being um uh, uh too forthright in our confidence that i know i'm good so right we we don't know but in terms of the inevitability of death none of us should deny that 
And we should see it as a meeting with Allah that will certainly happen. It will certainly happen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kullu nafsin maut. Every soul shall taste death. It will certainly happen. And some souls at the point of death, they will take flight. This will be the reunification. This will be the homecoming that they've anticipated. Right? And uh, in hadith, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that the souls of the righteous are drawn out of their bodies like water is drawn out of a vessel with a straw, with great ease. And as they are dying, they are being comforted by angels. Because of course, this is something unprecedented for the person dying. This is something new. This could induce great fear, great anxiety, great tension, great uncomfortability. So they are being comforted by the angelic. Relax. Your Lord is caring for you. Every, everything is okay. And the Prophet ﷺ even mentioned that the angels appear before such people in beautiful garments. In be they're, they're, they, they, look every, they look beautiful. Everything is intended to what? Be a source of calm and relief for the person in the midst of their demise. Everything is going to be okay. But for the unrighteous, it's mentioned that what? Their souls are yanked out of their bodies because they don't want to go. I am about to age myself terribly. Have any of you seen the movie Ghost? Oh man, I'm old, man. Yeah. Um, Ghost is a, is a movie that stars Whoopi Goldberg and Patrick Swayze. Uh, Patrick Swayze's co-star is his hair, as was always the case. No, I'm just kidding, that was a joke. But <laughs> that was, uh, uh, you know, Patrick said every scene he would, Make sure the hair is moving, you know what I'm saying? But there's a scene in Ghost, you can, you, can, you can check this out, where a soul is being drawn out of a body at death. And the soul is like wrestling, like fighting to, to, re, to remain an inhabitant of that body because it doesn't want to go. It doesn't want to go, right? And this, of course, would lead to a very agonizing, very painful death. Right? The righteous, their deaths are different than that. He continues. God's messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, said, the throne of the infinitely good trembled from the death of Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh. And God forbid if you are one of the beasts. As God exalted said, they are as cattle. Nay, they are more astray. Let yourself not feel safe from being removed from the corner of your home to the chasm of hell. You know, he mentions here that there's a verse in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ula'ika al-an'ami bal hum adal. Certain people are like cattle. No, they're more astray than cattle. And in this, you know, this is actually uh, to no fault of cattle, right? There's nothing wrong with cattle. Cattle are doing exactly what they're supposed to do, right? They're eating, they're grazing, they're procreating, right? They're drinking water, but that is their worship. You know, there's a, you know, there's a, a good writer, I believe she teaches at the University of Florida, Dr. S Sara Attili. And she's written an entire book about animals in the Quran. Beautiful book, beautiful book. I haven't had an opportunity to read it, but I've perused it. And she talks about how the Quran elevates animals as examples for people in most cases, right? That even in traditional Muslim cultures, people would name their children after animals, right? Fahd, panther, Asad. Lion, right? People would name, you know, Ghazala, Gazelle. People would name their children after animals that there is this esteem for the natural order, right? 
Some of you are probably thinking of other names that are actually animals' names. You know, Nimr, tiger, right? all of these different names that maybe you've heard before. But in this case, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is drawing a parallel between animals that have no uh, recognition of a metaphysical dimension of their lives that we can see. They're not praying, giving charity. They're not, they're just eating, procreating, you know, uh, grazing, uh, you know, uh, living according to their instincts. And you have some human beings who our lives are just as devoid of a spiritual dimension. We're just eating and drinking, procreating, and that's it. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, hum kal an'ami bal hum adal. They're like cattle. They resemble cattle in how they lead their lives. Just, you know, just hedonistic, materialistic. No, they're more misguided because there's nothing wrong with cattle when they do that. See, there's nothing wrong with, when cattle, when cattle behave that way, there's nothing wrong with, that's, that's what they've been created to do. We, on the other hand, have been created for more. You know, there's great conversation among everybody from metaphysicians, people that deal with religion and spirituality and stuff like that, to zoologists. What is it that really makes the human creature distinct? What is it about men and women that, that really distinguishes them from other life forms? And some of the answers you get are really interesting. Some people say it's thumbs. It's a thumb. That the, uh, that the fact that we have thumbs makes, gives us the ability to have what they call a prehensile hand. We can perform very complex gestures with our hands and we can uh, make tools. See, we're tool making creatures. We can make tools. So all of the technology, all of the innovation, this actually goes back to the fact that you have a thumb, that you can, you can make uh, more complex maneuvers was the word I was looking for with your hands than any other life form, right? You can do very complex things with, with your hands. Some people say it's that we wear clothes. Of course, I love that. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's that we wear clothes. No other creature wears clothes, right? No other, you know, it's, human beings wear clothes. This is something very unique about human beings. You won't find any other life forms that like clothe themselves. One of the most interesting answers, some people say it's laughter. That other animals make laughing sounds. But what is a laugh? Right? You'll never think about comedy the same way. Right? What, where, like, where does it, like this is a serious discussion among serious people. Where does a laugh come from? What is it? Where, like even some biologists have a very difficult time explaining what is a laugh? Where does it come from? How is it provoked? I mean, does it come from like the nerve center and then it, like, but it, and it happens spontaneously. Somebody says something and before you know it, <laughs> it's audible. It's, it's very strange. It's unique, yeah, right? It's unique. You won't see other life forms laughing at jokes, right? Maybe they smile, but an, act, an audible laugh, very uniquely human, right? Respect comedians, man, right? Uniquely human, an audible laugh. But the best answer, it is human consciousness. It is that we have the unique ability to see beyond the merely material. You see, we can actually imagine ourselves in history. So when Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran, Fa'ayna tadhabun, where are you going? You can actually think about the future. As a human being, you're, you're not limited to immediacy. Just thinking about like, you know, my, my appetites, my instincts, no, you can actually think. Hmm. You can actually see the inner meanings of things. This is why we produce what poets, artists, people that are trying to help us see the inner meanings of things. Someone who denies this essential human faculty resembles an, an, a, a different kind of animal, right? A person that's just eating, 
a person that's just drinking, a person that's just trying to, you know, satisfy their sexual appetite. They resemble like human beings have been created for more. Just look at who, just like, <clears throat> we should look at ourselves and marvel at how we've been created. This is why I, if, you know, some of the, I've heard some crazy things that people can do to, um, you know, help their, their faith. One of the things I recommend, go to a good museum. It can be an art museum, could be a museum of natural history, and just look at the things that human beings have produced. And that same consciousness that gives human beings the ability to produce things like that, that is what we're supposed to use to worship Allah. To look at our lives in a more deep and penetrating way than just somebody that's thinking about whoever dies with the most toys wins. A human being should never say something like that. But you have human beings that actually believe like that, right? They're like beasts. No, they're worse than beasts. May God save us from ever being that way. And make us people of lub, people of innermost core. You know, you'll find this refrain throughout the Quran, ulil albab, the people of innermost core, right? Those people of insight, those people of, you know, that see deep meaning, deep significance in the things they observe. Not people that just say, oh, whatever, it's, you know, it's whatever. No, no, I'm, 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 I'm looking for something more. He continues, it is related that Al-Hassan al-Basri, may God be exalted, have mercy on him, was given a drink of water. So he took the, he took the cup and he fainted and it dropped from his hand. When he came to, it was said, what happened? He replied, I recall the longing of the people of hellfire when they will say to the people of the garden, pour down your water upon us or whatever God has bestowed upon you. You know, here, you know, one of the things we have to remember is that life is a glimmer. It's a, a, a faint reflection of the hereafter. But there is a resemblance, right? Life, the life, the, the life of the dunya is not completely different than the life of this world. Because if it were completely different, then you wouldn't even be able to conceptualize the life of the next world. So when one is talking about torment, you have a... Um, phenomenological or physical reality of pain that you can reference. Okay, torment is something like that. When God talks about pleasure, when God talks about joy, you have kind of an analog for joy or pleasure that you can reference that should make you desirous of heaven, right? You know, I heard a story about one sheikh, and car guys will love this story. Car guys will love this story. There was one sheikh, and he was telling his students, if you want to make use of all of the beauty that you see in the world, every time you see something in the world that delights you, say to yourself, there is no lasting existence except the existence of the next life. Meaning, if you see something beautiful in this life, know that that beauty is magnified. That beauty will be lasting in the next life. And the students, they would say this if they saw a beautiful building, right? They saw, they saw an impressive building. You know, I was in New York over the weekend. I love New York City. Just the architecture of New York City, right? If they saw uh, a beautiful person, they would, they would say this. If they, ate, if they ate 
delectable food, right? Mmm. La Aisha siwal akhira. Right? They would remind themselves the life of uh, the life to come is, is even better than this. They said, but the Sheikh himself, he never said it. So they thought, man, does he never see things that impress him in the world? What a depressing life. <laughs> like he taught us this formula to remind ourselves of the beauty and the permanence of the life to come, but we never hear him using the formula. He said, but one day we were transporting him to a dars and a Ferrari rolled up alongside us. The Sheikh looked at the Ferrari and he said, Wala Aisha si wala <laughs> He said, there's no life except the life of the next world. Right? I said, that is the story for the car loving Salik, yani, for the the car loving spiritual, even the sheikh had to acknowledge the beauty of this car. Oh, right? the, the car made, made his heart jump, mashallah. So here, Hassan al-Basri was given a cold drink of water. And mashallah, this is a fitting day to talk about these uh, simple delights. You, when you drink a thirst quenching cold glass of water, on a hot day, it really is a thing, man. I mean, I see a knowing look on some of your faces. I mean, it's really a thing. It's like, even if it's just, I mean, like it's just momentary, right? You drink and your thirst is quenched. And I mean, it's not like it necessarily makes you cooler, but the sensation is very comforting. The sensation provides some relief. Hassan al-Basri, a great scholar of the Tabi'een. And just to break down that classification, the Prophet Sallallahu said that the best generation of people are my companions, right? Then those who come after them, then those who come after them. So those three generations of early Muslims, we refer to them as the Salaf al-Salih, right? The, the pious predecessors. And a Sahabi, a companion of the Prophet, alayhi salat was salam, is any man or woman who saw the Prophet while believing in him. If they beheld the Prophet, peace be upon him, with their eyes, while believing in him, he or she is a companion. Even if it was just for a moment. You know, I heard a sister make a brilliant argument about using partitions in the masjid. She said, if they would have used partitions in the masjid of the Prophet, والسلام, women attending Juma who saw the Prophet, who listened to his khutbah, they wouldn't be companions because they wouldn't have been able to see him, right? So this important status was something that was made available to them because they could see the Prophet ﷺ. But we attend Juma, we cannot see the khatib. And disembodied voices don't command authority. What am I listening to here, right? I, I remember thinking to myself, I don't know if I completely agree. But what a brilliant mind. <laughs> what a brilliant argument. A tabia, a follower, is anybody who saw a companion of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam while being a Muslim. And a tabit tabia, you can see the redundancy, is anybody who saw somebody, who saw somebody, who saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam while being in a state of Iman, while being in a state of belief. So Hassan al-Basri is a tabi'ah. He is somebody who saw a companion. Many people say he saw Ibn Mas'ud. He saw a companion while being in a state of belief. And somebody gave him a cold glass of water. And as he was drinking the water, he just fainted because he thought, 
It is delights like this. It is simple pleasures like this that people experiencing punishment in hell, they will be denied. Subhanallah. It's like that example I gave you of the Shaykh, but it's the opposite. Now I've never done that. And prior to reading this book, I had never heard of that. The next time you experience something you really derive comfort from, thinking to yourself, punishment in the next life entails being without all of these comforts. Like, like because, you know, um, subhanAllah, as people that are very comfortable, and most of us as middle class or even wealthy Americans, we're very comfortable we might have a difficult time really actualizing or conceptualizing what punishment means. Some of us, right? If we've never had health ailment or we've never really been hungry or, right? Some of us, especially if you haven't started your romantic life yet, because once you start your romantic life, you're going to know some pain. You're going to know some heartbreak. I, even if it's somebody that you remain married to for your entire life, Maybe they'll just say something that really hurts you. But some people, you really might not, I mean, life might be easy and enjoyable to such an extent that you're like, hmm, punishment in the next life. Hmm. You mean like when you go to Whole Foods and they don't have the juice that you like? Or something? <laughs> you mean like, when you're trying to get into the movies and they're all sold out? Like, yeah, I hate when that happens. No, no, you have to think things that you're enjoying, it would be like not having them. How uncomfortable might you be? You know, my wife and I, we were driving around today and we were actually going to pick up our car that was being serviced. And I just said, SubhanAllah, we're riding around the city in a climate controlled buggy. I mean, it's 99 degrees outside of this car. And inside the car, it's 58, 59 degrees. We're comfortably conversing, not even sweating. SubhanAllah. And this is so normal to us. We would scarcely think to especially thank God for it. We're just sitting, yeah, you know. Looking outside at people sitting on bus stops, sweating bullets. <laughs> I don't know. I think I want to go over to uh, have some ice cream on Taylor Street. I heard there's a, I heard there's a new place that uh, serves a, a matcha Oreo. <laughs> I'm going to go over there and try that. I mean, it's such an intriguing combination, isn't it? Matcha and Oreo. These people are so creative, mashallah. This is, I mean, this is the comfort that we, we live in. So what about thinking of some of those comforts and what if they were taken from you, right? How would that be? So next time you crawl up into bed and you're about to retire in your secure home, what would it be like to be completely without security? Like if you were in your home thinking about your home being invaded at any minute, how might... How, how uncomfortable might you be, right? The next time you're about to, you know, begin that delicious meal, what if you really didn't know where your next meal was coming from? How, how um, unnerving would that be? And then when you think about punishment in the akhirah, think about it as being infinitely worse than anything you could imagine, right? Anything you could imagine. You know, I remember I was sitting with a brother. We were in Yemen. And we were watching his children play. And he said, SubhanAllah, if I could, I would prevent my children from every kind of harm the dunya will throw at them. If I could. But of course, if I did that, then they wouldn't even understand the wisdom of the Quran. Now you have to experience some pain. You have to experience some, uh, 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 some struggle, right? So that you can, you can understand what felicity 
in eternity means and what torment in eternity means. You have to be able to understand that, right? Have any of you, again, I'm going to date myself. Have any of you seen the movie Pleasantville? Oh, my God. Obey. You are officially an old man. But Pleasantville, which is a good movie, I would recommend it. It's a very good movie. Is this, um, this picture where uh, uh, a contemporary uh, set of siblings, a brother and a sister, they get trapped in a 1950s sitcom. And everything is like super um, idyllic. The weather is always nice. People are always polite. People are always kind. There's no notion that anything ever goes wrong. You know, they go into a gymnasium. People are shooting. Every shot goes in. Every relationship is had. It's like, it's Pleasantville, right? But it's in black and white. See, it's in black and white. And when they get there, they start like mucking up the Pleasantville, right? Because they're coming from like, I guess, the real world. And so when somebody experiences anger, then they acquire color, right? If somebody experiences frustration, then they acquire, then they get their color, right? It's like they only became fully human through, those, through that negative emotion. As I was watching this, I thought to myself, subhanAllah, how would a person give da'wah in Pleasantville? What could you say? You know, um, when you die, it's not going to be like this. Die? What's death? Nobody ever dies here. Uh, huh. Yeah, as you were. Salam I mean, you know, what, what could you... No, no. It's you can only speak to someone about the realities of the next life that has had some exposure to both the pleasures and the pain of this life. So that you can say to them, the next life is felicity, it's enjoyment, it's joy, unless one is wicked, one is unrighteous, then it's pain, it's disappointment, it's torment, right? So here, Hassan al-Basri, he was taking a cold sip of water and he thought, this is what the people of punishment, they will be denied even this. Even this, this the enjoyment of just a thirst quenching glass of water. Imam Ghazali continues, oh disciple, if mere knowledge were enough for you and you did not need deeds beside it, his call, Allahu Akbar. Bismillah. He said that if mere knowledge were enough for you, right, and you did not need anything besides knowledge, God saying, is there any caller calling upon me? Is there anyone seeking my forgiveness? Is there anyone turning to me would be unnecessary? and without purpose. Basically, he's saying that if all you needed was knowledge to gain God's pleasure, then what need would there be for repentance? You have the knowledge, you're good. No, repentance is for what? The weakness of our souls. It's not about what we know. You know, SubhanAllah, I, love, I actually love talking about this. I'm going to date myself again. As you can see, I'm very old. You know, this is all died. No, I'm just kidding. My, my gray hasn't started to come in yet. But there's a movie called Scent of a Woman. Have, have any of you seen that movie? Okay. Some bad parts in that, but also a very good movie. But in the last scene, the lead character, played by Al Pacino, and he won an Oscar for this role because he plays a blind man. He's defending, I don't want to give, I don't want to, because you can go home and probably watch this on Netflix or Amazon Prime tonight, right? He did, because Malcolm X came out in the same year. Denzel should have won it for Malcolm, I know, I know, I know. But he did play a really good role 
in sin of a woman. In any case, he's defending a young man who, um, you know, essentially saved his life. And the young man is about to be suspended from school. But the young man can get out of his suspension if he, uh, in an unprincipled way, tells on people. He snitches. And Al Pacino's character says, all my life, I knew the right thing to do, but I could never do it because it was too bleep hard. It was too hard to do. And I remember looking at that, thinking this is very important because there is a clear distinguishment between knowledge and action. Every, every married person knows what I'm talking about. If you talk to anybody who's married and you ask them for marital advice, I guarantee you, they will give you the advice of a sage. Always. Every bit of marital advice is like, oh, just forgive your wife, man. Just be, just be more patient. Right? It's no big deal. Forgive and forget. Love erases those kinds of differences. Right? They start quoting ayat for you. If you find that you dislike something about your spouse, maybe you dislike something in which God has placed much good. It's not, it's not for you to tell them to change. It's for you to grow in your patience. Grow in your, this is an opportunity for you to become a more understanding person. And then right as he's saying that, his wife calls, screaming at him, get home, what are you doing? And he's like, look, I'm tired of you doing this to me. And you say, wait a minute, what about what you were saying to me? What, what, what happened? He said, oh, my situation is different. You know why his situation is different? Because when he's giving me advice, he's just talking about what he knows makes a good husband. See, this is just in his mind. This is what good husbands do. When his wife is calling, now he has to do what a good husband does. Much more difficult. See, it's much more difficult to put that stuff into practice because it involves his ego. See, he knows what he's supposed to do. He's supposed to say, no problem, babe. I'll be home in a second. Something in his nuffs won't let him say that. See, this is why everybody can give. When you're giving advice, man, you would listen to me talk about marriage and you would think, man, I know his married life is just... No, it's not. <laughs> But my wife and I love each other, mashallah. So we keep, it's a, it's a blessed struggle. But we're struggling against what? Our egos, right? Here, Imam Ghazali is saying, if just knowing the right thing were enough, there would be no lapses. If we all just did what we knew to be right, integrity wouldn't be a thing. You know, integrity is... It's probably best defined as like wholeness, that what you believe and what you actually do are consistent with each other, right? This is why they say what the greatest expression of integrity is doing the right thing when no one is looking because you know it to be the right thing. That's integrity. You know why that's a challenge? Because it's hard to do what we know to be right. It's hard to do what we know to be right. You know, most people who, um, you know, do bad things, they don't delude themselves into believing that what they're doing is the right thing. They know what? It's a weakness. I know, I know what I'm supposed to do. Something in me won't let me do it. I know what I'm supposed to do. I know what it means to be good. I know what it means to be patient. I know what it means to be understanding. I know what it means to be generous. I can talk about it. Doing it is a lot more difficult. So here Imam Ghazali is, is, is in a sense he's saying, look, don't be deluded into believing that just knowing is enough, right? My teacher, Dr. Sherman Jackson, he says, you know, 
we live in a cult of, we live in a post-enlightenment cult of genius where people think, you know, uh, just thinking the correct way is going to solve their problems. And I'm not saying anything about, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy. And yes, correcting one's thoughts is very important, but you also have to strengthen the soul so that when the thoughts are corrected, there's follow through, right? This is what we seek through prayer. This is what we seek through fasting. Like that's really, why do you think that we're fasting, right? I could say, you know, self-control is very important. Restraint is very important. These are very important ingredients in one's worship of God. But how will you be made to feel self-control, to do restraint? This is something that happens through fasting. He said, you, you have to do it. It's more than just talking about it, right? You have to do it. I can say discipline is important, but how will you do discipline? Making your prayers on time. So you're doing discipline. I have, I have to pray. I don't always want to pray, but I have to do it. That's discipline. You know, I've quoted Mike Tyson before, but I love this quote. They asked Mike Tyson, how did you have the discipline to become a champion? He said, discipline, it's doing what you don't want to do, but doing it like you love it. That's discipline. Doing something you don't want to do. For me, answering my son's questions. Because he's going to ask you 1,001 questions. Dad, daddy, dad, daddy, daddy, daddy. But then again, I say, all of his questions are about inquiry. He wants to know stuff. All of my daughter, my eldest daughter, all of her questions are about money. Dad, can you send me 40? Dad, can you send me 60? I, you know, sometimes I think, who is the genius that invented Zelle and PayPal and Venmo? It used to be enough for me to tell, if I asked my mother, mom, son, I don't have any, I don't have any cash on me. Dang, that used to work. Son, I have, I have, I have no cash, son. Oh. I tell my daughter I have no cash. Well, dad, can you Zelle me? You, PayPal me, dad. You have a PayPal? Yeah. You can Venmo me. That can, it's a, <laughs> I'm just like, hey, who, who came up with this? You know, you used to be able to say, I don't have any cash, man, that's it. You know, I've been, I, I don't wanna, I don't wanna make a, a crude joke, but you know, even some, you know, indigent folks, man, I don't have any cash on me, you can sell me, brother. I said, man, what was the word? <laughs> said, yeah. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? For real, I bet that, no kid, yo, bro, you got, you, can you spare any change, bro? No, I don't got nothing, man. Look, here's my cash app. <laughs> you know, I don't know, hold so long. The world is changing. The world is changing, right? But it takes discipline for me to answer those questions. It's like, I want my son to learn patience. And I want him to feel that his dad is there for him. So is he, yes, son. Yes, son. But like everybody else, I play the silence game. Hey, son, let's play the silence game. Whoever talks first loses. I know how competitive you are. <laughs> right, right. You know, but this is, this is, this is what, it's not just about knowing. It's about practicing. It's about doing. So uh, in summary, I will say, use your worship and use your relationships to really bring out the best in yourself spiritually. Because these are places you will have to do things that you don't want to do, right? Things that you know to be the right thing. You know how to be a good friend. You know, oh, man, I, I really, it's like my girl is having a crisis. She's calling me. I really want to say, dude, call somebody else. But I'm, a, I'm, an invest, I'm, I'm going to invest in this relationship. What's up? Right, this, you, you, you begin to learn how to subdue the nafs, right? To experience it, to taste it. And
uh, are there any questions in the space? Could be about this, could be about anything related or even something unrelated. Assalamualaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Good to see you, man, as always, mashallah. <laughs> so we speak a lot about heaven and hell. And recently I've been reading the Sufi book mm. that talks a lot about the tariqah. Mm. It's more of a present dunya and way to get that spirituality got. Is there any pitfalls with that concept or is this heaven and hell kind of an, essence, an essential concept we need to be remembered about? I do think because human beings generally are quite preoccupied with ideas of their mortality, like what's going to happen to me? Just, I mean, I, I think, and you think about it more as you get older. It's not, you know, a teenager probably isn't thinking about that, but I guarantee you someone in their seventies, someone in their eighties is thinking about, you know, what's, what's next? What's after this? I, I can feel the span of my life drawing to a close. Emphasis on an otherworldly, uh, an afterlife, uh, heaven and hell, I think satisfies that perennial human concern, right? It's something we want, it's something we're concerned about, right? However, um, books like the book you've been reading, they make some very, very uh, compelling arguments about being in a paradisiacal state, being like in a heavenly state in this world and being in a hellish state in this world. So like I've heard uh, one sheikh, he said, if you look at descriptions of heaven, there's really just like three essential or four essential components to how heaven is described in the Quran. One, nearness to God. That's the most important. Two, la yahzin. They're not sad. People are free of their uh, grief. Three, la yakhafun. They're, they're free of their anxiety. They don't have any fears. And four, kana'a, contentment. They're content. He said, all four of those, we can have those in the life of this world. We can actually have nearness to God. We can be relieved of our grief right? Sadness, what is behind us. We can be relieved of our anxiety, our fear of what's in front of us. And we can be content with our provision, what God has given us. And if you have that in the life of this world, it's almost like a heavenly uh, state. Likewise, you know, Ibn Ta'illah, he said that the companions of Zulaikha the women uh, of the, the, the friends, uh, the other society women that were invited to dine with the wife of the Aziz who attempted to seduce Yusuf. She gave them fruit and she gave them knives. And then she told Yusuf to come out before them. And they were so um, taken by Yusuf's physical beauty, that they did not realize that they were cutting their hands, that Yusuf's beauty, in a sense, anesthetized them, they, them being completely enraptured by the beauty of Yusuf, anesthetized them so that they couldn't feel themselves cutting their hands. Ibn Al-Ta'ala says, if this is how they were anesthetized by the physical beauty of Yusuf, what about someone that experiences the spiritual and metaphysical beauty of God? What pain do they feel, right? What, what, what disappointment do they experience? How are they upset somebody in that state? He said, if God were to make himself manifest, to jalli, if God were to make himself manifest in all of his splendor, even to the people in Jahannam, they would cease to feel the torment of hell because they would be in a state of beholding. He said, in, an, in a real sense, heaven or hell 
is just about whether or not you're in that state of beholding. If you're beholding God in that way, your state is heavenly. If you're removed from God in that way, your condition is hellish, right? So these are creative spiritual writers that are using heaven and hell to inspire us to be in better conditions in the life of this world. But I don't think that they're, they're, they're downplaying the significance of the heaven and hell that come after death. They're just saying you can have a taste. One might have a taste of hell or one might have a taste of heaven depending on their worship, but an actual heaven and an actual hell, these are um, essentials, fundamentals of, of our religious worldview. And Allah knows best. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Um, thank you for the talk. I You're welcome. I definitely enjoyed hearing about the, um, the um, when you said like, the next life is better than this life and how this world is a prison. And it reminded me of um, a line in the Quran. And I also arrived late. So I'm sorry if you already mentioned no, this, but no, um, it's uh, um, the, what is this life except the enjoyment of delusion? And I was wondering if you had any analysis or interpretation of that line specifically with the context of um, what we talked about today. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Yeah, this, this ayah of the Quran, وَمَا الْحَيَاةَ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا مَتَعْلُ غُرُورِ is um, really a verse in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is using a literary form called hasr, like the life of this world is nothing else. Now, the life of this world is many different things. Um, uh, but its overwhelming character is deception. Because everything about the life of this world is beckoning you to invest in it as though you would be here permanently. That's what this ayah is saying, that Everything about the life of this world is telling you what? Spend all of your time, spend all of your money, use all of your focus, use all of your interests here because this is real. You know, the word dunya actually comes from uh, the root word dunu. The word dunu means to be close. Dunu, to be close. The dunya is what the, I would translate dunya immediate world, right? There are worlds beyond this world, but dunya, this is that which you can touch, that which you can, you can grasp, that which you can taste, even though it's fleeting from you with every moment. You know, mashallah, Professor Martin Wynn from Fairfield University, uh, but I think he did his training at Harvard Div, uh, Vietnamese convert to Islam, Beautiful, beautiful brother and crackling smart. He uh, wrote a book called Modern Muslim Theology. I would recommend that book for all of you. But in the book, he, he makes uh, an amazing point that it's simple, but it's like, wow. He said, you know, just as each of us could describe ourselves as living, we could also describe ourselves as dying. Right? Like in this moment, you're dying. Right, because with every breath, we actually move closer to that, to, to our demise. But the dunya is telling you, no, 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 no. You know, this is it. This, like, all of that is fantasy, right? Again, the Quran says what? Asatir al awwaleen. You don't believe in all of those myths, all of this afterlife. That, this is what is real. Even though your body breaking down, you, your health failing, you seeing people that you love die, right? You're at this age now, grandparents are dying, aunts are dying, uncles are dying, parents are dying, friends are dying. We're coming out of a global pandemic. There are many signs that suggest to us what? The dunya is not a place of permanence. It just isn't. I don't care who you are and I don't care what you believe. 
This is an irrefutable, indisputable fact of human existence. We can't stay here forever. But the intensity with which the life of this world beckons you to invest in it, to believe in it, to hold on to it, to cling to it, that is the delusion. That's the ghurur. That's the delusion, right? And like all delusions, dating myself again. I'm gonna start saying that. Have any of you seen the movie, The Prestige? It's a great movie. It's a great movie. You guys are like, wait, is this Ted Leaf? I thought it was so like a movie, uh, <laughs> The Prestige. I, that, that's actually one of my favorite movies actually. But in The Prestige, one of the central themes that comes out of The Prestige is that there really is no magic. The one who wants to experience something magical, they have to lean into the delusion. You have to lean in to the, to the sleight of hand. You have, to, you have to believe it possible. You have to kind of lean into it in order for it to be magic for you. If you're a completely skeptical person, man, I don't believe any of that. Then you're not going to enjoy magic. That's not, that was some trick. I don't believe that. Only a person that, well, oh, oh my God, did you? Then, right, that, that, that connection is there. The same thing is true with the delusion of the life of this world, right? You have to lean to, to, for a person to accept that this life is all there is. Invest in this, build this up, cling to this, hold to this. You have to kind of lean into that because there's so much around you suggesting that isn't true, right? That's, that's delusion, but you have to kind of lean into it, right? You have to lean into it. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in his um, clear book is telling us, don't be deceived, don't be deceived, right? See this world for what it really is. And to recognize what, um, what remains of it for you is really just your deeds. Your deeds and your relationships. Your relationships too. Because the Prophet ﷺ talked about the Southern Qajariya and he said, What? Someone that has a, a, a child that prays for them. Many scholars say this is indicative of not, I mean, the particular thing mentioned is the child that prays for the deceased parent that will continue to benefit the deceased parent. But Anybody that leaves an impression on other people that they want to pray for them when they're gone. That will, that will, that, that's meaningful. That means something, right? That I lived my life in a way that even when I departed this world, there were people who were still praying for me. They were still thinking about me. It wasn't like I died and they said, oh my God, good riddance. My neighbor said, now I can finally get some sleep. I'm glad he's gone. Now I maybe come outside and there won't be trash on the back porch or something, something crazy like that, right? No, that, oh, I can't believe this person is gone. And then your good deeds, those things you do, that will remain with you. Everything else is going back to dust. Everything on the face of this earth is perishing. Except for the face of God. That will remain forever. MashaAllah. We have some online questions. Um, one question says, uh, how do we know when a trial in life is a trial for purification of sins, an opportunity for rewards, or a punishment for sins? Bismillah rahman rahim The point that I always emphasize here is the point of Sheikh Abdul Qadr uh, Al Jilani. He said, in actuality, everything that happens to you is neutral. You only know if it's a blessing or a curse according to your reaction to it. If it increases you in your faith, in your devotion, in your awareness, in your certainty, in your nearness to God, it's a blessing. 
no matter what it is. Could be a divorce, could be the diagnosis of an illness, could be, um, you know, uh, the, the, the recession that we're all about to enter and you lose your stock, port the value of your stock portfolio vanishes. Could be, but if it increases you in awareness about the true nature of this life, it increases you in faith, it was still something good for you. It was a blessing. Even though it was a trial, it was a blessing. On the other hand, whatever increases you in doubt, whatever increases you in disbelief, whatever distances you from God, it's a curse. Even if it appears to be something good, maybe, you know, you inherited a bunch of money from a deceased family member. And you think, what a, wow, this, this is life changing. But it changed your life for the worse. Now you can't be bothered to pray. Too busy spending money. <laughs> right? That, it, was, it, was, it was a curse. Right? It was a curse. So how you know is your reaction to it. What was your reaction to it, right? If it was some kind of lesson, did you pause long enough to get the message? If you say, ooh, man, I put all of my time, all of my effort, all of my energy into building this business. I neglected my prayers, neglected my spiritual growth, neglected my family. And, this, and it still went out of business. I still lost a huge sum. If that prompts a recognition that I'm going to continue to do business, but with more balance, it was a blessing. It was a blessing. Right? On the other hand, if the business is a dazzling success, but you don't pray anymore, you don't give, you can't find time to try and grow yourself spiritually, it was a curse. It was a curse. Right, so it's all about your reaction to it. It's all about your reaction to it. And Allah knows best. Um, one question says, when you say pray for someone after death, what exactly should we say? Mm. Just asking God to accept their deeds, to um, forgive them, to um, expand their grave, to make their reckoning easy. Um, to continue to reward them for even things that you're doing that maybe you're doing inspired by their example, right? To continue to reward them, to continue to elevate and raise their rank in the next life. Um, all of these prayers, you know, do I, you know, although uh, Imam Amnawi has his, uh, Imam Annawawi has his Tadhkirah, um, a book of different ad'iya of the Prophet والسلام, do I, is a place that the Prophet ﷺ intentionally left open. You know, it's the 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 adiyah or the prayers that are narrated from the Prophet ﷺ are excellent, and we should use them. But never neglect praying from your own heart, saying your own words in a language that you speak, in an idiom that makes you feel most comfortable, but still has respect in it. Right, you are talking to God, you know, you want to say, yo, big man, look out for me. It's like, wait a minute, hold on, wait a minute. Wait, we, you want to be comfortable, not that comfortable. You know what I'm saying? Yo, big guy up there. She, she little serving down here, man. Can you kind of like throw down a blessing or something? No, wait, wait, hold on, wait, 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 no, wait, wait. Whatever language you use that still, you know, conveys, yeah, I need, uh, devotion, um, um, you know, a depth of, of, you know, worship, you know, you're still worshiping. You're just doing it in, you know, an idiom with which you're comfortable, but you have to do that. The Prophet ﷺ, the dua is the essence of worship. You have to do that. So using the, um, the duas that we have from the sunnah, excellent. Right, but also speak talking to Allah from your heart in your language. This is something that will, will increase your closeness. The feeling of closeness to God will come from speaking to God directly in your language. Right, mashallah. So pray for them, uh, 
uh, in ways that resonate with you, right? Due to time on, um, for all the people that have online questions, due to time, we need to pray. So that the mug group, so inshallah, um, we'll note your questions for next week. Inshallah, we'll ask them next week and begin in the class. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم العصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصل الحق وتواصل الصبر سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين